All right, good afternoon again. This is our fourth session. This one's on scientific evidence for a recent creation. Before we begin our study, let's have one more word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for everything that you've provided us in your word and in the nature around us that describes you and your love for us, your care for us, and your provision for us. Father, help us as we study this afternoon that we will understand more about your creation and your creative power and your love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Isaiah 45, 18, it says, For thus says the Lord, He who created the heavens, He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. So He made it for us. For a blessing for us. This afternoon, we're going to look at a lot of examples of evidence for creation and for the flood and for the historical accuracy of the book of Genesis. One of the recent discoveries that's kind of fun is that of soft tissue in dinosaur bones. This happened kind of accidentally, as I'm told, that uh, they were taking a big bone from place to place and accidentally dropped it and it broke. So that exposed the marrow. And one of the scientists uh, that was looking at that thought she would dissolve away some of the mineral content there with an acid. But then what was left was soft tissue that was still pliable. So this soft tissue is being found in dinosaur fossils that are supposedly 65 million years old. They've even found red blood cells, as you can see on the right here. Uh, how could dinosaurs that are thought to be 65 million years old still have soft tissue and even red blood cells preserved in them for that long? So the idea that soft tissue could exist for 65 million years is highly problematic for evolutionists because we'd expect soft tissue to have been completely degraded in a far shorter period than 65 million years. But soft tissue preservation in dinosaurs does fit very nicely with the biblical understanding that dinosaur fossils are evidence of rapid burial by the global flood, and that happened only about 4,500 years ago. Let's talk next about carbon-14. This is one of the most exciting things to creationists uh, in terms of science. Carbon-14 is an unstable form of carbon that's created in the upper atmosphere when gamma rays hit atoms of nitrogen-14. And they free up neutrons, which in turn combine with a nucleus of nitrogen gas to form carbon-14. Now plants take in carbon-14 from the atmosphere, uh, and animals get it from eating plants. And this continues as long as they are living, but you stop taking any carbon into your body when you stop eating and you, you, you die. Uh, carbon-14 decays into nitrogen-14, and we can measure the rate at which that occurs today. It's about half of it in 5,730 years, give or take a little. So by measuring the amount of carbon-14 in something that once lived and comparing it with the amount in living things and assuming that when it died, the carbon-14 to, car to uh, carbon-12 ratio in the atmosphere was the same as today's ratio. If you make those assumptions, then you can come up with an age, a um, number of uh, years since that animal died and stopped taking in more carbon-14. Now because of its short half-life of 5,730 years, carbon-14 dating can only be used at most to determine ages of a few tens of thousands of years. Dinosaurs, which are 65 million years old, uh, can't be dated by carbon-14 because they're considered to be too old. Now, to put this into perspective, if the whole Earth were made of carbon-14, nothing but pure carbon-14, half of it would degrade in 5,730 years, and then you'd be down to a quarter in another 5,730 years. Basically, every atom of carbon-14 in the whole Earth, if the Earth was pure carbon-14, would degrade in about 900,000 years, less than a million years. And of course, the amount of carbon-14 in the typical samples that we take, like plants and animals, is a much, much smaller amount. So it, it basically means that um, after about 90,000 years, the amount of carbon-14 that's left in most objects is too small to be detected even by our best instruments. So if something has carbon-14 in it, it definitely can't be over a million years old. And because we can detect it with our instruments and our uh, samples are fairly small, uh, 90,000 years would be tops 
or anything um, if it has carbon-14 in it, at least if we can detect the carbon-14 in it. Now, carbon-14 has been found in all sorts of places that evolution says that it shouldn't be there. Uh, carbon-14 has been found in dinosaur fossils, thought to be 65 million years old. So we know from that that they cannot be 65 million years old, or all of the carbon-14 would have uh, decayed by radioactive decay and be gone. They would all be uh, all, all be uh, dissipated. Uh, it's found in fossilized seashells. It's found in petrified wood. Uh, carbon-14 has been found in diamonds, thought to be 1 to 3 billion years old. Now, there are some people that say, oh, well, maybe God created the Earth a long, long time ago and then he just terraformed it recently. Well, if that's so, these diamonds are not more than 100,000 years old uh, because they still contain carbon-14 in them. So the, the uh, creator could not have created a rocky Earth billions of years ago. Um, that's impossible due to the evidence of carbon-14 dating because those diamonds that were thought to have been created down in the core of the Earth one to three billion years ago uh, are actually, we know, much, much younger than that. They could not possibly be a billion years old because of the carbon-14 we find in them. Carbon-14 is found in fossil fuels. So oil, natural gas, and coal, all of them have carbon-14. So that tells us those can't be millions or billions of years old. Now coal is the remains of compressed plants. It's found in different depths of rock. It's found all throughout the whole geologic column. And scientists have found that when they measure the amount of carbon-14 in coal seams, regardless of their location in the world, or their depth in the geological column, they have statistically equivalent amounts of carbon-14 in them, indicating that basically they were all buried recently and they are of roughly the same age uh, within the realm of statistical error of sampling. Because of the um, emphasis on radiometric dating to try and date rocks and things, and they come up with millions of years, a group of creationist scientists came together in a project they called Radiometric Age of the Earth Project, or RATE, R-A-T-E. And uh, they finished that and went on with a RATE too. But one of the things they did was uh, they took samples of zircon crystals and did some tests on them. One of the byproducts of radioactive decomposition of uranium, uranium decays with several different steps, about eight different steps, and you end up with lead. Lead that is not radioactive, so it doesn't decay any longer. But along the way, when you're decomposing uranium, uh, you generate helium gas. Because at various points, an alpha particle gets uh, spit out of the nucleus. That alpha particle combines with a neutron. And an alpha particle and a, I'm sorry, an electron. An alpha particle is basically a proton. And if you combine it with a, an electron, you have um, actually, a couple of the a couple of the alpha particles in a, an electron will give you helium gas. One would just get you hydrogen, but you, it combines into helium. So one of the byproducts of this decay from uranium down to lead is helium gas gets generated at several points along the way. Now, as you know from your experience with helium gas, you buy the balloon, balloon up, and uh, you tie it to the kid's bed rail, and in the morning it's halfway down, and pretty soon it's on the floor. And that's because helium atoms are very, very small. With only two, two protons and a, you know, um, two electrons, then uh, it's very, very small. Hydrogen is the only thing that's smaller. And uh, so it can leak out in the holes, uh, the tiny little holes that exist in the rubber. So sometimes you pay a little extra money, you buy a mylar balloon, because that's less porous. And the mylar balloon, although it costs more, will last longer because it's less porous and the helium can't go through. Well, helium is so small, it can actually come out from the middle of rock. It's not trapped in the rock. It can pass out and bounce around between uh, atoms and escape from the rock. Now, helium can diffuse even from the hardest materials like rock. And scientists use this drilling rig that uh, you see on the um, left. They use that to drill in New Mexico to obtain samples from Precambrian rock. Now, Precambrian rock is that that is below where we find any fossils. So that's probably the basement rock that was created at the time of creation. So it's, it's pre-flood rock. It doesn't contain, contain uh, typically doesn't contain fossils. 
Uh, it doesn't contain sediment. It's not a sedimentary rock. It's basically the solid core, of, the solid uh, rock uh, near the core of the Earth. Now, dating these by traditional methods would give an age of one and a half billion years. So they obtained samples of these zircon crystals. Now, zircon crystals contain lead in them as a result of the decay of uranium. And scientist Robert Gentry, who is an Adventist, found that they still contained 58% of the helium that would have been produced by the decay of the uranium that was in them. Now, if they were really billions of years old, we would expect that the helium would all have diffused out. But no one knew the actual diffusion rate of helium. So that had to be measured. So scientists predicted what the rates would be, what the diffusion rates would have to be if the crystals were 6,000 years old, as the Bible predicts. And that's what we see in the red dots. And if they were billions of years, those are the predictions seen in the magenta dots down at the bottom. Now there's a factor of 100,000 in difference. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 orders of magnitude difference. Huge difference between the two, between the two models. But then they sent off samples of the zircon crystals to a laboratory to have them tested in terms of their actual helium diffusion rates. And once they measured it in the lab, now they had to work through an inter intermediate company so people wouldn't know who was sending in these samples or why. They didn't tell them why they were doing this uh, or what they expected the results to be. And the actual results are shown in the blue dots here. Uh, which curve do they tend to line up with the, uh, the top curve predicting 6,000 years of history or the bottom curve predicting billions of years of history? What do you think is a closer match? The top. <laughs> yeah, it seems to line up perfectly with the prediction of 6,000 years of age. So basically the, the helium is diffusing out at, uh, at a fairly rapid rate, but there's still a lot of it left because there's been so little time for it, to diffuse, to, for it to diffuse out of the rock. And it's results like this that are so exciting, because they basically tell us that the, the Bible is true when it tells us about the history of the earth and how long it's been. This is Lake Eyre in uh, Australia. This uh, is Australia's largest salt lake. Scientists measured the amount of salt accumulated in it. They believe it's the world's oldest salt lake. They calculated that the amount of salt found would have taken about 73,000 years to accumulate if you assumed that one flood occurred every 50 years. Okay, so that's a starting point. Well, if you go to the South Australia National Parks and Wildlife Service and you look at their website, at least somebody looked at it in 1991, they found that the website said almost all the area of Lake Eyre is covered on average once in eight years. Wow, so it's not 50 years. Right now it's being covered once every eight years. Well, that reduces things quite a bit. That reduces the time period for accumulation of that salt to only 12,000 years. So we're getting closer. And this has to be an upper limit because the fossil evidence suggests that the inland Australia area was much wetter in the past, being covered in rainforest during the tertiary period when the lake was supposedly formed. And with flooding every year, as could have occurred in the past, the minimum time for accumulation might be as little as 1,500 years. Now, evolutionists date the tertiary period when they think this lake was formed as between 2 and 65 million years ago. So even if Lake Eyre formed 2 million years ago, the so minimum amount, and we assume floods every 8 years, like the website says, 99.4% uh, of the expected salt is missing. So who stole the salt? Now, if we assume it's older and we take into account the wetter climate of the past, the problem becomes even greater, with up to 99.99% of the expected salt missing. Now, the scientists that did the work were puzzled by this discrepancy. They couldn't find any explanation for where the salt could have gone. But if only several thousand years have elapsed since the flood of Noah's time, as the Bible tells us, then maybe all the salt is still there, and there's no theft to be reported to the police. Some things that we think are old are actually young. They may look old, but they're not. The island of Circe and Mount St. Helens both give us examples of things that are young. We know that from experience, but they look old. Formed by a volcanic eruption in 1963, the island of Circe near Iceland has intrigued scientists because it looks like landscapes that most people would think are much older. According to a New Scientist article, the island has excited geographers who marveled 
marveled at canyons, gullies, and other land features that usually they think take tens of thousands or millions of years to form were created in less than a decade. Biologists also, also marveled at how quickly plants, animals, and birds have colonized the island. The Icelandic Institute of Natural History put it this way, we now have a fully functional ecosystem on Circe after being created in 1963. So it's younger than I am. I tell my grandkids to impress them, I was born the year that the last two states were added to the Union. And they think that's very impressive. But that was only 1959. If you were to visit Circe today, you were unaware that it was less than 60 years old. Uh, I wonder how, you would, how old you would imagine it to be. So the next time you hear that a particular landscape took millions of years to form, just remember the island of Circe because things can look much older than they really are. Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. And my wife and I actually had a chance to visit there uh, nine months after the eruption. We drove to see it. It was pretty impressive with trees um, blown over down and uh, ash all over the place. It was, And uh, I have to admit to uh, passing one of the signs that said, don't go any closer. They were afraid it was going to erupt again. It, it didn't end up erupting uh, majorly again, but they were worried for our sake, and so the rangers chased us back out where we weren't supposed to be. But we got an even closer look that way than we should have. Uh, it was pretty impressive. But here you see before and after pictures. You can see that the basic, basically the top half of the mountain, huge amounts, uh, was just blown off. This eruption demonstrates that geologic catastrophe can produce in hours and days geologic features previously believed to have taken millions of years to form. When we see what the volcano did in such a short time, we can better appreciate how the catastrophe of Noah's flood formed the much larger geographic, geological features that we see on planet Earth. One of the surprising results was a 25 foot thick layer of sediment that was exposed in a cliff along the north fork of the Toodle River. The Toodle River is where much of the debris flowed. It's composed, composed of finely layered sediment. And from eyewitness reports and photographs and monitoring equipment, it is known that this whole deposit, 25 feet thick, formed in just three hours from 9 p.m. to midnight on June 12, 1980. It was deposited from black clouds of fine, hot ash mixed with gas, blasting at high speed from the volcano in a pyroclastic flow. Ash-laden and heavier than air, the flow surged down the side of the volcano and along the river valley at more than 100 miles per hour, hugging the ground and depositing ash. The big surprise was that the sediment deposited in fine layers called laminae. You would expect a catastrophic high-speed flow to churn the fine particles and form a uniform, well-mixed deposit, but uh, and, and it had been conventionally thought that fine layers had to accumulate very slowly, one upon the other over hundreds of years, but Mount St. Helens showed that the coarse and fine material automatically separated into thin, distinct bands, demonstrating that such deposits can form very quickly from fast-flowing fluid material, and that can be either liquids or gases. Uh, and since then, laboratory experiments have shown that fine, fine laminae uh, also form quickly from flowing water. This shows how finely layered sandstone deposits in other situations, such as some of the lower layers in the Grand Canyon, likely formed rapidly, which could have happened within the time scale of Noah's flood. The Mount St. Helens eruption also demonstrated how canyons can form much faster and in a different manner than conventionally thought. Ongoing eruptions eroded the thick sediment dumped at the base of the volcano, producing multiple channels and canyons. One such channel was dubbed Little Grand Canyon. They call it that because it's about 1 40th the size of the real Grand Canyon. Now its side walls were up to 140 feet high and its width up to 150 feet, and there's a small stream of water running down through it. So someone across, coming across that canyon today uh, could easily conclude that it was just eroded slowly and gradually over many, many years, hundreds or thousands of years, by that little creek that's running down the center of it. But the formation of this canyon was documented. It was caused by a mud flow caused after a small eruption of Mount St. Helens melted snow within the crater on March 19, 1982. 
The mud built up behind the debris, burst through the debris, and cut the canyon in a single day. So the creek didn't cause the canyon. The canyon caused the creek. Understanding how sediment formed quickly in, in canyons can also be formed quickly better informs us about the origin of the original, larger, and more famous Grand Canyon. During the flood, the Bible tells us that the fountains of the great deep opened up. There must have been massive earthquakes. Tsunami after tsunami must have swept across the earth. Um, on uh, YouTube, I've seen some video of the uh, tsunami in Japan or the results of the tsunami in Indonesia in 2004. Uh, in Japan, I think it was 2011. Amazing uh, waves, amazing damage. But if the whole globe is covered with water and you've got earthquakes and volcanoes going off all over the place, the tsunamis must have just been going one right after the other and circling the earth and, and creating a, a real mess. Um, scientists believe that during this time, uh, continents split apart, moved around, and crashed together, forming mountain ranges and volcanoes. They call this catastrophic plate tectonics. Uh, as you see here, some of the Earth's uh, cold crust uh, might have been subducted, that is, thrust deep under the mantle as these um, plates moved around and went under each other and crashed together. Uh, and in fact, seismologists have actually measured cold rock deep under the North American continent beneath us. If it had been there for millions of years, the temperature would have evened out so that we know it must have been thrust there recently. And this Pictures from the NASA website, they're showing how seismologists have measured this cold rock underneath the North American continent. Another thing we know is that rock is brittle, right? It tends to break. Well, we, we see sometimes bends in the rock like this. How could that happen without the rock shattering? Well, it's probably because these were muddy layers that were laid down as sediment during the flood, and then they were disrupted shortly after the flood while they were still soft and pliable. But you find formations of this uh, in many places around. Um, we can see these bends of rocks. And what these bends in the rock tell us is basically materials laid down during the flood were subsequently bent and it had to happen shortly after while they were still soft because now they're hard rock. I want to tell you about another discovery which is kind of interesting. This is uh, from 1986. So not so terribly long ago. In 1986, workers from a brickyard near uh, Guangdong, China, were digging for clay in the countryside, looking for clay for bricks, when they discovered various pieces of bronze. Now, bronze you wouldn't normally find in clay. That's got to be, uh, if it's an artifact, it's got to be uh, man-made. They contacted the authorities, and archaeologists from YZ University in Chengdu came and excavated two different pits they were filled with an outstanding uh, set of arch ar uh, uh, artifacts of the San Zing Dui people. From these two pits, nearly, nearly 1,000 artifacts were recovered, including objects made of jade and bronze and gold and ivory, pottery, marble, and implements of bone. We see some of them here. Roughly 800 artifacts from the pits are made of bronze, including large and small statues, dozens of life-sized bronze heads, some of which, as you can see, are partially overlaid with gold. Now, orth authorities estimate that these artifacts have been buried for somewhere between 2,700 and 4,700 years. In China, the history goes a little bit farther back than here in the United States. That's something I found in traveling around the world. Uh, we talk about the 1700s and 1800s here. Their history is a little longer than ours, the, the, their known history, recorded history. Uh, the figure on the left here um, is thought to be a figure of a high priest. And the figure on the right is thought to be an altar. So that's kind of interesting to us as Christians. Uh, archaeologists also recovered parts of a tall bronze tree, which they cleaned up and reassembled. Now this stands about 13 feet tall from its circular base to the top of its branches. So let's look a little closer at it. Given, given its dimensions, 13 feet high, it's basically a life-sized fruit tree. And we're going to look at some of the details in a little bit more detail, a little closer. 
Now the branches radiate, radiate out from the central trunk. They grow outward and upward, and then they arch over toward the ground. Each branch terminates in one piece of fruit. Now, the majority, excuse me, the, uh, the fruit is cloaked in ornate calf bronze leaves. And strikingly, the leaves near the fruit on the majority of these branches are cast in the shape of large menacing knives. A little bit of danger there. The tree is inhabited by a large serpent with a long, narrow, snake-like body that is cast so it undulates to and fro down along the trunk. There are two horns on the top of the serpent's head. The serpent has small shoulders and front feet on which it stands, and it glares out with large eyes. Kind of a scary thing to come across. Now, some of the serpent is missing, but the pieces that have been recovered include a tail-like limb that terminates in a long knife and another short appendage that is cast together with a human hand complete with an opposable thumb, anatomically correct rows of knuckles, and detailed fingernails. Now, what does this remind you of? Is there anything that this might remind you of? I see some nodding of heads. The tree of knowledge of good and evil with a serpent, menacing fruit. Yeah. It appears that the bronze tree of San Zingdui depicts the tree of the knowledge of good and evil from Genesis. Now, it's estimated that the San Zingdui people thrived over a period of about 2,000 years from 2000 B.C. to 800 B.C. Scholars believe Moses wrote Genesis about 1450 B.C. So this means the bronze tree of San Zingdui is likely the oldest known man-made artifact confirming the book of Genesis. It's sitting in a museum over there and you can go and see it. Let's talk about ice layers next. Greenland and Antarctica have glaciers that get snow each year and they build up over time and they compress the layers below. Here we see scientists taking ice cores in Greenland. Scientists looked at variations in the ice to try and detect seasonal bands similar to growth rings in trees. Now we know from growth rings in trees that once in a while you'll have a strange year and you'll end up with two growth rings because maybe you'll have a period of growth where it's warm and then it turns cold for a little while and it gets warmer. So you might have two growth rings instead of one. Where the, so you have to be a little careful in looking at that as actual years. I think that these layers of ice are even worse because I think we really don't know whether a band represents a season or does it represent a big storm. And you could have multiple storms per season. Um, so we don't know for sure. But scientists counting these layers estimated that the ice represented 160,000 years of time there in Greenland based on the number of bands that they found in the ice. They drilled 4,000 feet down through the ice. So that's the foundation of the story. On July 15, 1942, during World War II, a flight of six B-38 fighters and two B-17 bombers with a total of 25 crew members took off from Presque Isle Air Base in Maine, headed for the United Kingdom but they were forced by bad weather to land in the ice on Greenland. They figured they would uh, probably send out fuel, get fueled up, take off from there, and, and continue their mission. And while the crews were rescu rescued nine days later, the aircraft uh, ended up being abandoned on the ice. And over the intervening 50 years, they ended up eventually buried by the snow, buried by the ice, and part of the glacier. A couple of gentlemen named Pat Epps and Richard Taylor of Atlanta had been searching for the lost planes for years. They thought maybe they could find some World War II aircraft preserved in uh, remarkably good shape and maybe they could get a chance to restore one and get it to flying condition again after it had been in the icebox for a while. They discovered them finally in 1988 thanks to new ground penetrating radar technology that was developed at that time. And in the 50 years since they had landed, they found the planes had been carried two miles from their original location, and by the time they were found, they were under 264 feet of solid ice. That's in 50 years. So over the course of multiple expeditions, the team sent a small steam probe down through the ice first, followed by a 264-foot-long steel pipe, 
And next, they use the steel, steel pipe as a guide to what you see on this side. They call that the gopher, or the thermal meltdown generator. They heated that, and that melted its way down, following the pipe, melted its way down to the airplanes uh, at about two to four feet per hour. So relatively slow, but you know, visible progress. Once they got tunnels down there, workers were lowered into the ice, and you see that on the top right. And they carved a cavern around a P-38 using a hot water cannon. So they carved it out of the ice with hot water. I'm not sure I'd like to work uh, at the bottom of a 264 foot uh, long, five foot diameter tunnel, but somebody's brave enough to do that. Probably teenagers that don't have that part of the brain that links cause and effect yet grown. So they're too young to know how dangerous that is. Anyway, they carved it, they got the, the plane, they disassembled it, and brought it to the surface piece by piece. And ultimately, they made five tunnels uh, from the surface to the P-38 below. So a total of five tunnels, about 20 feet long. You can get some pretty big pieces out. So this is actually a picture of the aircraft in the process of being lifted out. You can see the five parallel tunnels that they've built, and they're lifting it up. Um, they're lifting what looks like the fuselage there. So they're lifting it up. So all these sections of the P-38 then were taken back to the uh, hangar. They named this P-38 Glacier Girl. They reassembled it, and that's a picture of the aircraft after it was assembled, reassembled in Kentucky and restored to flying condition. In October 2002, it took to the air and flew once again, as you can see in this picture. Now, of particular interest to us, I mean, it's neat that it's a plane, but it's, it's of interest to us to know the elapsed time, the depth of the plane. If 264 feet of ice could be formed in only 50 years, what would that then say about the time required to deposit the roughly 4,000 foot average depth of the ice sheet over Greenland? Well, the, the true picture is more complicated and it's not linear because the ice can't compress as fast as it gets deeper and must spread out at that point. It's still clear that the earlier estimate of 160,000 years for ice accumulation of 4,000 feet is way out of range. Uh, because 4,000 divided by 264, that's not very many. It's not very, and, and times 50. I recently took my grandchildren to the little town of Manitou Springs, Colorado, just outside of Colorado Springs. And they have a cave there called Cave of the Winds. And when you go through the tour, they'll tell you about how the rocks are millions of years old and how many millions of years it took for stag stalagmites and stalactites and flowstone to form. But how long does it actually take for things to petrify or for flowstone to form? So let's take a trip to a little town called Narsboro. It's 13 miles west of York, England. The so-called so petrifying wall at Narsboro has been a tourist attraction since the year 1630. That's probably one of the longest running tourist attractions in the world. Its water originates underground and has a high mineral content. As the water splashes onto hanging objects, the mineral calcite, that's calcium carbonate, is deposited along with small amounts of other minerals. And gradually these deposits build up and they coat the object with a crust of rock. The time needed for petrification depends on the size and porosity of the object. Small teddy bears take between three and five months. I don't think they'd much good, be much good for your grandchildren after that, after that three to five months. They might use it to hit each other and cause serious damage, hitting Mommy, then he hit me with a rock. No, that was your teddy bear. Larger porous items, like large teddy bears and clothing, can take 6 to 12 months to petrify. And non-porous items, such as a top hat or a fireman's helmet, can take up to 18 months to be encased in stone. The most impressive petrified objects are now just two bulges sticking out of the flowstone there, and they're pretty hard to identify. These are the remains of a Victorian top hat and the lady's bonnet that were left at the waterfall in the year 1853. And these hats are now completely covered in a thick layer of flowstone. So, so much for it taking millions of years, or even thousands of years, for such flowstone thicknesses to occur. Objects can petrify in months and years. And so teddy bears like this one demolish the powerful cultural myth that tries to prevent people from believing what the Bible says about the true age of the earth. Tree trunk fossils are frequently found cutting across 
many geological layers in the geological record. And hence, they call them polystrate trees. Poly means many. Strate means stratum or layer. Polystrate fossils cut vertically through multiple layers in the geologic column and thus defy evolutionary time. Trees do not stick up from the ground for thousands, much less millions of years after they die, waiting for sediment to gather around them. Um, I know in our little piece of the Black Forest, as I said on Friday night, when trees die, they'll stand for a little while. The woodpeckers will enjoy them, but eventually a windstorm will come along and they get blown down and then they rot. If the insects and the uh, disease uh, attack them, they can't stand there for millions of years while rock builds up around them, layer by layer by layer. So dead trees don't stand for a century, much less millions of years. So it's impossible that polystrate fossils were buried gradually over many thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. The top part of the tree would have rotted away before it could be protected by sediment. So polystrate fossils point to rapid burial and are evidence for the reality of the global flood as recorded in the Bible. Polystrate fossils provide direct evidence that the rocks formed rapidly, consistent with the young creation of the Bible reports. What do marine fossils on the top of Mount Everest tell us about the biblical flood? Well, we find fossils of marine creatures in limestone near the summit. There's some pictures of them. That means that this area must have been underwater at some point in the past. And everyone agrees that the top of Mount Everest was once under the sea because the fossils are there. But many people don't associate these rocks and fossils with Noah's flood because they think there's not enough water to cover the highest mountain. Actually, if the earth was round like a ball, water, the existing water on the surface of the earth, would cover all of the land almost two miles deep, about 10,000 feet. The Bible tells us in Genesis 7.20 that water covered the highest mountains of the time to a height of 15 cubits, which we think is a little bit more than 20 feet. But they don't, um, people are not considering how the flood changed the Earth's topography. It appears that the mountain ranges probably formed at the end of the flood, as we know them today. Um, well, with vertical Earth movements toward the end of the flood, the mountains rose and water flowed off of the continents into the newly formed ocean basins. And that's why we find marine fossils at the top of high mountains. Indeed, such mountains must have formed quickly and recently. Otherwise, they would have eroded quickly after they were formed. And that brings us to the topic of erosion rates. Erosion rates are also a problem for deep time. Evolutionists generally teach us that the continents formed at least two and a half billion years ago. Now, water is the main culprit that dissolves many minerals and loosens soil and rock from the landscape, transporting them to the ocean. And day after day, year after year, like an endless procession of freight trains, the rivers of the world cart tons of decomposed rock across the continents and dump it into the ocean. By comparison, the amount uh, removed by winds and glaciers and ocean waves along the coastline are just tiny amounts, insignificant. Now, sedimentologists have researched many of the world's rivers and calculated how fast the land is disappearing. The measurements show that the average height reduction for all the continents of the world is about 2.4 inches per thousand years. At current rates, the entire continent of North America would be reduced to sea level in just a few million years. How can any landform then be older than that? Two and a half billion years would have eroded a height of 93 miles of continents at that rate. And our continents were not likely 93 miles high. Uh, so it defies common sense. If erosion had been going on for billions of years, no continents would remain on Earth. Then we would have a global flood, right? If everything eroded away. Arches. Scientists in recent years have found that measuring current rates and applying them to the past doesn't always result in long ages, and rock arches are one example. Erosion and eventual collapse of these actually happens at a fairly high rate, and at current rates, it turns out, these arches can't last for millions of years. Thus, they could not have lasted for millions of years in the past. If millions of years had actually elapsed, there would be no stone arches left for us to look at today. They would all have collapsed long ago. Um, this is the picture of Landscape Arch in Arches National Park in Utah. It's the longest rock, rock arch there. And around 2.45 p.m. on September 1, 1991, people heard cracking and popping sounds coming from Landscape Arch. And then part of the rock on the underside fell. 
Royce Morrison, the gentleman who was at the arch on that day, he captured photographs of the rock fall after hearing the cracking noises. I think I'd want to do that from a safe distance. Uh, Michael Miller had been beneath the rock that the arch rock that next arch that day, and he heard popping and cracking noises from above him. That's not very reassuring. Uh, he hiked up the slope behind the arch, and he actually recorded video of the rock fall, and you can view that on YouTube. Uh, scary stuff. Now the pictures you see here are of Wall Arch in Arches National Park in Utah. On the night of August 4, 2008, the people who were sleeping at Devil's Canyon Campground, not too far away, reported hearing the sound of thunder, but they looked up and couldn't find any clouds in the sky, <laughs> no lightning. That's because this arch had just fallen. When thousands of tons of sandstone come crashing to the ground, it causes quite a rumble. You can probably uh, pick that up on uh, seismographs in the area. So these are before and after pictures of the arch that collapsed. So why do these fall? Well, erosion and gravity reign supreme over sandstone. Rain, ice, and groundwater slowly but relentlessly eat away at the natural calcium cement that holds the arch's sand grains together. Eventually, there isn't enough of this cement left to withstand the pull of gravity, and so the whole structure finally comes crashing down. So if it had been millions or billions of years, we wouldn't have any arches to look at. So this is one of uh, evolution's arch enemies, I suppose. Yeah, it would have had a different name. Had to rename it by now. These are some resources that I think you'll find interesting. Um, and I'll leave it there if you want to get a picture of it or something. Uh, first of all is a Seventh-day Adventist uh, resource. This is Geoscience Research Institute. They have the website grisda.org. Uh, so that's a, an excellent uh, resource. Creation Ministries International, they have a website, creation.com. They also have a Roku channel and a YouTube channel. Um, I signed up for their um, newsletter, and once or twice a week you'll get a little news um, email from them that talks about recent scientific discoveries and advances that um, prove that the Bible is true whether the record of creation or the record of the flood. Um, and so that's where a lot of these examples have come from. It's from my email archives and their website. So you can go to their website, creation.com, and sign up for um, that newsletter. You get that by email if you're interested. You can also search for their past articles. The Institute for Creation Research is another excellent resource. That's icr.org. They have a YouTube channel as well. There's a website, Answers in Genesis, AnswersInGenesis.org. They also have a YouTube channel. Now, they're the ones that have the full-scale wooden ark down in Kentucky. So you can go and visit what they call the Ark Encounter and also the Creation Museum not too far away. Uh, and some of the examples uh, that you have see here come from them. Another uh, good website is Genesis Science Network. Uh, they have a great Roku channel that I enjoy a lot. They also have a YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is listed under David Reeves Ministries. David Reeves is the, the founder of the Genesis Science Network. Uh, they also have uh, their website, genesisciencenetwork.com, and they're also on uh, cable and satellite television networks, many of them. So you can take advantage of that as well. So those are some resources that I'd like to put you to. If you've been intrigued by anything that you've heard this weekend, that's a way to get more information and, and learn uh, future discoveries as well. The creationist and evolution debate is often characterized as pitting science against faith, but the fact is everyone lives by faith. The creationist believes the Bible and accepts it as the true story of origins by faith. And the evolutionist believes scientists who claim that the universe started in an instant from out of nothing with no underlying cause or purpose and that life spontaneously arose by pure chance and then evolved over millions of years. So I ask you, which takes more faith? It's hard to say. Romans 1.20 tells us, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Sometimes people insist on maintaining stubborn unbelief, even despite the evidence. Great Controversy, page 572, tells us, In past ages, 
when men were without God's word and without the knowledge of the truth. We call that the dark ages. Their eyes were blindfolded and thousands were ensnared, not seeing the net spread for their feet. In this generation, there are many whose eyes become dazzled by the glare of human speculations, science falsely so called. They discern not the net and walk into it as readily as if blindfolded. Isn't it interesting that we call the World Wide Web the net? Interesting. I hadn't thought about that before. God designed, uh, they, they discern not the net and walk into it as readily as if blindfolded. God designed that man's intellectual powers should be held as a gift from his maker and should be employed in the service of truth and righteousness. But when pride and ambition are cherished and men exalt their own theories above the word of God, and I think we've seen this weekend, that's exactly what Darwin and um, Lyell and various others did. They wanted to come up with a theory of origins that would allow them to dispense with any need for a creator God. When pride and ambition are cherished and men exalt their own theories above the word of God, then intelligence can accomplish greater harm than ignorance. And Acts of the Apostles, page 266, says, Men cannot with impunity reject the warnings that God in mercy sends them. For those who persist in turning from these warnings, God withdraws his spirit, leaving them to the deceptions that they love. So God invites us to explore the evidence. After all, he says in Isaiah 1.18, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. So God expects us to use the reasoning powers that he has created us with. And true faith is not blind belief with no evidence, or even belief despite or against the evidence, but true faith is actually based on evidence. As I said last night, I've concluded that God gives us enough evidence so a reasonable and willing mind can be convinced, but not so much that the decision becomes such a no-brainer that we lose the freedom of the power of choice. It's almost as if he leaves the possibility for a little bit of doubt if we choose to doubt. Yesterday and today, we've seen a lot of scientific evidence that supports the truth of the Bible. And as time goes on, there are more and more discoveries in science that lend support to the Bible. And what a blessing that is. But most importantly, along with the invitation that God gives us to reason together, God also offers us salvation. Because this verse in Isaiah 118 doesn't, uh, 118 doesn't stop there. It says, Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. I think if we can be convinced by evidence that God's word is true with respect to the history of the world, I believe we'll also have confidence in the Bible's account of the way of salvation that God provides us. And then we can take advantage of his loving offer to save us. If you've developed a trust in God's word and you'd like to accept God's offer of salvation, would you raise your hand with me today? Amen. Let's bow our heads. And then we'll have a question and answer. Father in heaven, thank you for all the evidence and the increasing amount of evidence that you're giving a skeptical world as to the truth of your word. Thank you for all the evidence in the Bible that not only tells us about history, but tells us about how much you love us, how much you want to save us, how much you want to live forever with us. That you'll move the center of the universe, the capital of the universe, to our planet, the only one that failed, the only one that fell, because you love us so much. You want to tabernacle with us. Thank you for that, Father. Please give us courage as we go out to our world that we'll be able to share this light to them that uh, they can glorify you as the creator of the universe. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Anybody have any questions? We'll deal with that. Yes, one question. Uh, do we have a microphone? Uh, if not, I'll remember to uh, repeat it. All right. You know, you talked about carbon dating, and I kind of got lost while you were talking about that. But if somebody came up to me and we were talking, and we were talking, and this is certainly not, I'm not, I have no, not much knowledge in 
this kind of um, field. But if they wanted to tell me, oh, we've got carbon dating today, you know, it, it gives the answer to how old things are. I'm not sure I could explain my way out of that. Yeah, yeah. And that's where some of these websites uh, can help. You can watch v videos on YouTube that explain about how it works. There was a great evolution, um, evolutionist authored uh, video on uh, the differences in DNA between chimps and apes. They explained that, you know, if you ignore 18% of their DNA and 25% of our DNA, then you can come up with that number. And they explained that out in the, out in the open. So there are a lot of resources available to you, so that can help. Carbon-14 is one that they probably won't come to you and ask about because carbon-14 is the one that has the youngest ages. You're most likely to, to be hit with something like potassium argon or some of the others uh, which are used to date things for um, you know millions or billions of years because uh, they have slower decay rates. Um, but I would say probably try to educate yourself in terms of uh, maybe some YouTube videos on um, I know there are a lot of excellent ones from Answers in Genesis, from Creation Ministries International, uh, Institute for Creation Research. So those resources are some that you can take advantage of. But, but basically, the the rule for carbon-14 is half of it goes away every 5,730 years. So after the first 5,730 years, it's half gone. After another 5,730 years, it's down to a quarter. And then it's down to an eighth, it's down to a sixteenth, and a thirty seconds, and a sixty fourth, and a hundred and twenty eighth, and a two hundred and fifty sixth, and a hundred and a thousand and twenty fourth. A uh, thousand and twenty fourth is how much Indian heritage is uh, reportedly in uh, Elizabeth Warren's ancestry, right? So that's an easy one to remember, uh, which, which is more than mine. Um, so it keeps getting so small within short periods of time that you can imagine at five thousand years at a clip, you're pretty much. Uh, eliminate all of the carbon-14 in a relatively short period of time. Um, decay rates of uranium are thought to be in the billions of years, and so um, they're a little more, more problematic. Uh, there are still ways that, as creationists, we can understand them because of the assumptions that are based on them and so forth. But I, I didn't present that one that uh, this time uh, because I think carbon-14 is the most promising and, the, and probably the most helpful of the ones that are available to us today. I hope that helps a little bit. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, Robert Gentry, yeah. Robert Gentry, he's an Adventist that uh, worked at the Argonne National Lab in the Chicago area. And uh, he did some fascinating work on uh, radiocarbon halos. Uh, so he did some wonderful pioneering work in that. What he found, he spoke in this church. That's neat, Robert Gentry. I would have liked to see that. Um, well, his studies found that if you take um, mica um, from within uh, granite rocks and you slice it off, mica is very, it's layered. That's the shiny stuff that you see in granite. If you flake it off, you will find inside there are little spheres where the uranium that's decaying inside shot out these alpha particles that causes damage by melting the crystal when it lands. And so they form what are actually spheres within the rock, tiny little spheres. But as you flake the mica off, they develop this very scientific method to flake the, the mica off. They use a piece of scotch tape, they put it on the rock, they pull it off, that pulls one layer. They take another piece of scotch tape, put it on, pull it off, and by that sophisticated technological advance, they were able to peel the mica off one layer at a time, and eventually you get to the point where these uh, these concentric circles that you get with each layer get to the maximum, and then they would go back down. And at the maximum point, you're basically able to measure the diameter and see these, what they call radiocarbon halos. So that's a side effect of um, a side effect of the radioactive decay of uranium in several, like eight steps down to lead. Well, what happens is about the third step from the end, 34th step from the end, uh, you're down to polonium. And polonium uh, has very short half life Some of them are just hours, some of them are just uh, months, but very, very short periods of time. And what he was showing was that 
Uh, these halos had to form in relatively short periods of time. The, mol the rocks couldn't have just been molten and mixing because the evidence of these radio halos would be all mixed up in like a cake batter in your mixer. Uh, so they must have been uh, solid for a, a long enough period of time um, to, you know, they must have been um, not molten for billions of years like we were told. Uh, the other thing that's coming out of it that's interesting is some work that a gentleman, I'm trying to think of his name, but a gentleman from, I think, the Institute for Creation Research, but don't quote me on that, has done more recently. He's found that the polonium halos, which Robert Gentry believed were probably just scattered in the rock by, by God just to confound the evolutionists because the, they could form in a so short a time that it couldn't have been molten rock. Uh, what they probably... Uh, came from is actually water migrating along the mica plains, grabbing the polonium, which is water soluble, or maybe the predecessor of it is, which is uh, argon gas, I believe, um, which is a gas which can also travel through the rock. And they collected at sulfur atoms nearby, because the polonium halos are very near to the uranium halos. So, um, the more recent study is showing that probably water moved the polonium out to the uh, outside of where the uranium is, you know, a millimeter or so apart, and formed the polonium halo in a very short period of time. But to form a halo takes something like 500,000 um, to a million, if I recall, uh, radioactive events. And so this is starting to be very strong evidence that the radioactive decay rate of uranium was much quicker uh, because these halos can only form if the rock's not too hot, that it would melt. Um, it would, uh, you know, the damage that's caused to the crystal if the rock's too hot then uh, heals. Uh, and it can't be um, too cold uh, because then the water is out of the rock. And uh, anyway, he's done some work that indicates basically that the radioactive decay rates it looks like had to have been more rapid in the past for some reason that we don't understand today. And that could well explain why uh, many of the radio, um, radioisotope dating, uh, radioactive dating that we do end up with larger uh, times than we expect because the decay rates may have been very different in the past. And those polonium halos are one evidence that they had to have had a lot of um, decay events in a relatively short period of time because of the short half-life of polonium compared with the ring. So that would be well worth looking up. Look up uh, radio halos. I wish I could remember the gentleman's name that's done the most recent uh, work on that. But I think it's Institute of Creation Research, ICR.org, you can find that. So he basically picked up where Robert Gentry left off and went farther and, and discovered some new, uh, new, new discoveries. Any other questions? Thank you for putting up with me in this afternoon and this weekend. I hope that you go away with a little more hope and a little more encouragement because the God of the Bible is true and the Bible is true and he loves us. And that's about all I can say. Have a great day.